So welcome everybody. We're really excited to have the first talk of the Microscale um, series, seminar series. And um, I am helping to organize with uh, Marco Pollan and Roy Holzman. And so if you guys have any questions or any suggestions at any point during the time, please feel free to email us. Um, and what we wanted was for this to be interactive like the conference usually is. And so what we were thinking is that we would ask our speakers to talk for 30 minutes and then we'd have a Q&A and then we could have, depending on time, breakout groups where people could have smaller discussions about the, uh, the talk and sort of more um, ideas from the talk. And so that's sort of the plan. We're hoping to keep all of this within one hour. Okay. Um, and so today's speaker and our first speaker for the series is Professor Mimi Cole. From, um, she's a professor of the graduate school at the, in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we're really excited and honored to have her as our first opening speaker. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's won many awards and honors. Um, I'm just gonna list a few. Here, she's won the MacArthur Genius Grant, the Presidential Young Investigator Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the John Martin Award from the Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography, the Borelli Award from the American Society of Biomechanics, the Rachel Carson Award from the American Geophysical Union, and the Maybridge Award from the um, International Society of Biomechanics. And these are just a few of her several honors and awards over the years. Um, she studies the physics of how organisms interact with the environment using both field and lab studies um, of their fluid dynamics and the biomechanics of their structure. And today she's going to be talking about locomoting in a turbulent environment and ways to study the microscale processes in a large scale ocean. Uh, welcome Mimi, we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you everybody for showing up as little postage stamps on my screen to, <laughs> to uh, uh, kick off this seminar series. I'm uh, delighted to have been invited to do it. And Shepa gave, um, uh-oh, this is not good. If you just click with your mouse. Okay. There, okay. So uh, Shilpa gave me some instruction. She said, give an overview talk that could lead to a good discussion, but use some examples from our research. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. So instead of just telling you about one research study in great detail, I'm going to um, uh, do a more general thing. And what I tried to do is to think about a problem that all of us who study micro scale biophysics have to deal with, and that's the issue of scale. And um, we have several challenges. We need to design small-scale experiments to measure organism behavior and function under physical conditions like the ones they experience in the large-scale ocean. And I'm going to focus on hydrodynamic physical conditions today. But we have another challenge, which is to include the behavior or function, or function of real organisms that we can measure at fine scale into analyses at larger scale. So uh, um, until recently, until this crew of us who are interested in um, uh, micro scale processes in a big ocean, most hydrodynamic studies of small organisms done on fine scale, both models and lab experiments, were concerned with how the organism moves through the water and generally there was no ambient flow. And conversely, larger scale field measurements and models had a focus of transport by turbulence and currents in natural bodies of water. And early on, the organisms in these models were just passive tracers carried by the flow. But what I'm trying to do, and I think a lot of you are trying to do, is to look at how the interaction of an organism's motion through the water and the surrounding realistic ambient water flow affect their performance of ecologically important functions and also where they go in the water or on surfaces and the signals they encounter along the way. <laughs> 
So the approach that we use to deal with these different scales uh, has a number of steps. The first thing we do is measure water flow in the field. So we'll measure boundary layer profiles, instantaneous velocity fluctuations, uh, things like that. Then we try to mimic the field flow in uh, wave flumes where we're able to measure um, uh, physical characteristics and chemical characteristics on a much finer scale than we can do in the field. So both water flow and local chemical concentrations, for example. Then the third step is to take those fine scale measurements that we made in the flume and mimic them in an even smaller device where the performance of the organism can uh, be measured. And then um, after doing all that, we want to take the organism performance or function that we've measured and plug that into agent-based models of the organisms in larger scale um, uh, flow fields measured in the field. So that's the series of steps. And what I want to do is um, show you just some examples of the kinds of things we can do uh, at, on these various steps uh, uh, with some examples from my work. And the work I'm going to focus on today, uh, the system is um, larvae of benthic organisms. So bottom dwelling organisms like these things growing on a dock release um, microscopic larvae that are transported by ocean currents and that's how they disperse to new habitats. But where these larvae recruit onto new surfaces is important to a number of important ecological processes. One is the dynamics and the genetics of populations of organisms uh, geographically and the other is at a particular site um, larval uh, recruitment is very important to um, affecting the composition of communities of organisms living on surfaces. But my concern is how larvae recruit onto surfaces. So I'm going to focus first on the fouling community, which are all these creatures that live on ships and docks. And uh, uh, first, we should think about how a fouling community develops. So if you hang a clean flat surface off a dock or put your shiny new boat in the water, after about a day, it gets covered with microorganisms that form a biofilm. And after about a month, early invertebrate colonists such as these tube worms start showing up. And after about a year, you have a complex um, very rugose community of sponges and sea squirts and barnacles and all kinds of things. So a very critical step in the process of larval recruitment to a surface in a fouling community is contacting the surface and testing the surface to see if it wants to stay. And of course, what we care about is contact with and testing of a surface exposed to ambient water flow, not still water. So uh, let's go through these approaches I mentioned. The first thing is to measure flow in the field. And my field site uh, for this study is this very unappealing dock in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And we used acoustic Doppler villa symmetry to make detailed measurements of water flow uh, across uh, the fouling communities there. Here's an example of velocity measured two centimeters from the surface plotted as a function of time. And you can see in a harbor, the uh, mean flow is very slow, but there's all this uh, back and forth flow, which is due to wind chop, small waves uh, in the harbor. So we want to mimic the field flow in a wave flume so we can make more fine scale measurements than we can do in the field. And I did this uh, work uh, with John Cromaldi in his lab in Colorado in his big flume. And uh, what you see here is velocity plotted as a function of time for my Pearl Harbor data and what we mimicked in the flume. And uh, we can do a spectral analysis of our data and we can ask how much of the variation in velocity is due to fluctuations at different frequencies. And you can see the waves here due to the wind chop and then the turbulent eddies that are going to be carrying our larvae around. And you can see that we were able to mimic the temporal variation in flow in the wave tank. Uh, so it's very similar to the field. <laughs> 
Um, but now we have to think about our larva on a surface and uh, larvae are only a few hundred microns tall. So what kind of flow velocities do they encounter in these fouling communities? So we uh, use laser Doppler anemometry, which is wonderful because you can measure water flow with very fine spatial resolution. So we were able to measure flow just 500 microns up from surfaces on various fouling communities in this flume. And here's an example. This is instantaneous flow measured 500 microns from a surface of tube worm tubes, an early uh, uh, fouling community. So its velocity is a function of time. And the thing to notice is even that close to the surface, we see pulses of flow as those waves go by. We can also measure mean velocity profiles above the substratum. And so we've got a characterization of the fine scale flow just within a few centimeters of the surface. So now we want to mimic that really fine scale flow in another device where we can measure the performance of these microscopic organisms that we can't see in the big flume. And so we made a mini flume, this little tiny flume, uh, where we could, um, the, here's the flow direction. We had collimators to mimic the velocity profile and we had a wave maker so that we could mimic the waves. And we could put, um, uh, natural fouled surfaces on the bottom or on the top of the, the wave tank. And so let's think about these two worms I've been talking about. This is what the larva looks like. And we can ask, how does its larva behave in flow along a surface like that um, where it might want to uh, settle onto the bottom? And uh, here are some trajectories we measured of the larvae. Uh, the top is unidirectional flow, and the bottom is unidirectional flow with the waves superimposed. And you can see that those waves are important, and they make the larvae move up and down and um, sample more water than uh, if it were without the waves. If we look more closely right along the surface, on the top you see the trajectories of living larvae and on the bottom of dead larvae that aren't doing anything active. And what we see is that the living larvae look like they're bouncing along the substratum, but the dead ones do not. So uh, to summarize a lot of things we learned in this device, just so you have an idea of what you can do with a contraption like this, we saw that these larvae actively bounce along the surface. And what they're doing when they touch down is they're tasting the surface, that's contact chemoreception. And they bounce like this regardless of whether it's unidirectional or waves, whether the surface is above them or below them. And they do it whether it's a clean or a biofilm surface. However, once they touch down, they sit there much longer tasting the surface if it's got a biofilm than if it doesn't. And eventually they decide that's where they want to stick. So, um, let me show you another example of mimicking fine scale conditions in devices where uh, we can measure the performance of organisms. So let's think about the hydrodynamic forces that can sweep a settling larva off a surface. And we can use our um, laser Doppler anemometer measurements of flow 500 microns from surfaces. Uh, in the big flume to figure out what the flow would be like at different positions within these fouling communities. So here's an example uh, for the top of an oyster and then down behind the oyster. And what you see is there's very big differences in flow on a scale of microns, depending where one of these little guys lands uh, in the fouling community. So can we make a device that could mimic the, these pulses that we measured along a surface? And we did build such a device and it was driven by something called a Pico spritzer, which can deliver uh, very uh, carefully calibrated pulses of flow. So here's a frame of a video of a pulse of water flow in our device. So we used PIV to get the um, instantaneous velocities and you can see the, uh, the pulse coming out of the nozzle right along the surface uh, at the bottom of this. The little dots you see are larvae and we can digitize their behavior as they're hit by these pulses of flow that 
that we can uh, control. And this just shows you the time course of a pulse of water. So a standard way that's been used for years to measure the adhesive strength of larvae uh, is the shear to blow them away in steady flow. And so what happens is the steady flow pushes on the larva. I've got a, 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 a gastropod larva here and it's attached to the surface by mucus. The mucus stretches and eventually it breaks and the larva blows away and we measure the shear to do that. However, mucus and a lot of other biological glues are shear thinning, which means at low shears, they behave like an elastic solid and they have to be sheared a great distance before they become a fluid. And so if we do a realistic flow pulse, what we find is the mucus stretches in the pulse and then the mucus is like a bungee cord and it recoils after the pulse is over and so we find larval adhesive strength in pulse flow is much greater than in steady flow. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is an example of why it's important to get the temporal scale as well as the spatial scale of the flow just right. <coughs> Let's think of another example and the kinds of things we can learn. Bryozoans are um, common members of fouling communities. Uh, here's one and here's what its larva looks like. And we can um, ask, is that larva gonna wash away from these two microhabitats I've shown you? And we can, in the pulsed flow, measure the velocity it takes to blow a crawling larva away while it's noodling around, walking on the substratum, uh, sampling where it wants to be. And this is the mean value and the standard deviation for the velocity it takes to blow them away. And what you can see is uh, if they're crawling on top of an oyster, they're going to blow away. But if they're behind the barnacles, they can stay put. Now, in contrast, we can measure the velocity to blow a stationary larva away that's hanging on more tightly. And what you can see is it can stay on top of the oyster, whereas the crawling one can't. So this tells us that we need to know the behavior of an organism as well as it's, a, because that's going to affect its adhesive strength and determine where it can stay in these communities. Let me show you yet another example of fine scale conditions and devices uh, um, where we can measure what the organisms are doing. Um, if we want to figure out the effects of body shape and body orientation on the hydrodynamic forces and moments on uh, an organism on a surface, um, we're like a larva, we're going to need to determine the flow around the body and the forces and moments on the body. But these things are really tiny and force transducers for something that small have a really high signal to noise ratio, but there's a much easier way to address these kinds of questions. We can use dynamically scaled physical models of larvae. And basically, if you build a large model of a small larva, the ratios of the forces and the velocities are the same in the water around the model as in the fluid around the real larva if they both have the same Reynolds number. So here's an example of the cyprid larva of a barnacle. And uh, there's the real one and the big model that we built of it. And so we've made the length bigger. And so if we uh, move our model at a lower velocity and increase the viscosity of the fluid, for example, by using mineral oil, we can keep the Reynolds number the same. And so we can measure easily the forces on our model, so a drag and a vertical and side lift. And we can use those measurements to calculate the forces on the real microscopic animal. And we can also measure the moments, the pitch, the yaw, and the role uh, on the model. And um, we can use those forces and moments to calculate the mechanical stresses in the attachment of the larva to the surface, which is going to determine um, uh, whether it's going to wash away or not. And so then we can say, where will a larva wash away in our fouling community?
And um, we can also use particle image villa symmetry to figure out why the shape and the orientation of the organism affects the forces and the moments that we're measuring on it. And I won't bore you with a lot of results, but just summarize the kinds of things we can learn by doing these sorts of uh, small scale experiments. Uh, when we think about the flow encountered by microscopic organisms on surfaces, we learned that it depends on the micro scale, it depends on the micro topography and where they're sitting and the flow is pulsatile. If we ask what determines whether a tiny animal is swept away, we learned that the adhesive strength depends on the time dependent properties of its adhesive and on its behavior at the time the pulse hits it. And if we are concerned with the effects of morphology on hydrodynamic forces and moments, our model experiments uh, helped us figure out that shape and orientation and adhesion area are all critical. And um, the larva, the way the larva comes off, it can be sheared, spun, or peeled off, uh, peeled off the surface. And so we can figure all of these things out by doing these fine scale experiments that are based on conditions we measured at larger scale. Now I want to move off the substratum and briefly consider how do swimming larvae in turbulent flow get to the surfaces that we've been um, studying so far. So uh, again, to study this, we need to mimic uh, the flow we measured in the field in a wave flume and make measurements on a fine scale. But we're going to use different techniques this time. So here's a, a frame of a video we made in a wave flume. The benthic community is on the floor of the flume. The water is flowing back and forth in the waves. And all these little snowflakes are neutrally buoyant marker particles illuminated by a sheet of laser light. And we can uh, use videos of the motion of those particles to do particle image velocimetry and calculate instantaneous velocities like you see here. We can also um, uh, Whoops. We can also uh, have dye uh, oozing off of the surface of our benthic organisms to simulate uh, uh, odors that might be coming off the substratum. And we can put a filter on a second camera uh, that's synced with the first one that only lets through the um, fluorescent dye and not the particles. And we can use, uh, calibrate the brightness of the pixels that we see here to odor concentration coming off the uh, reef. So we have simultaneous measurements of local chemical concentrations and of uh, flow velocity. And if you look at a video of our data of concentrations and velocities superimposed, this is the kind of information that we can get. And so what, what we see by looking at the videos is that the velocity vectors and the odor cue concentrations change very rapidly with time on a scale of seconds. And if we look at any instant, we see that the velocity and the odor concentrations vary on a very fine spatial scale on the scale of millimeters. And um, so let me show you an example now of what we can do with information like this. Uh, uh, if uh, I'm now going to tell you the example of the larva of a sea slug that lives on coral reefs. And this is a, a, a planar laser induced fluorescence image of the cue coming off the coral. And the brighter and lighter the pixel, the higher the concentration. And if we think about a microscopic larva of the sea slug swimming in this odor concentration field, we see that as it moves along, it's going to go from where it's black, where there's no odor, and it's going to move through a filament of odor and then be in no odor again. So uh, can we mimic the fine scale uh, condition of odor uh, filament encounter to see what the larva might do. So basically our problem is there's a Q filament, the larva swims through it, and we want to know does it have any rapid behavioral responses to a very brief encounter with that cue. 
So let me orient you to what you're seeing here. This is the larva. It swims with a um, ciliated organ called a velum. Uh, it has a shell and it has a foot like a little snail. And uh, the larva swims this away. We figured out how fast it was going. But the water flow relative to the larva is in the opposite direction at the same velocity. So what we can do is tether our larva and let it swim in a small flow tank where the water flow relative to the larva is the same as its swimming speed. So it's swimming along with its velum uh, and um, thinking it's, it's out in the deep blue sea. Uh, the velum is expanded and the cilia are beating when it's in filtered seawater with no cue. But we can put stripes of odor in the water that moves past this larva. And here you see it's a, a Q filament labeled with fluorescein. And when a larva swims into a Q filament, we see that it retracts its velum. And when it retracts its velum, it stops swimming and it sinks if it's not tethered. And um, we can vary the concentration of Q in our filaments to determine the threshold concentration to cause this behavior. And when a larva exits a Q filament, it, uh, the velum re-expands, the cilia resume beating, and it swims again. So what we've learned from these experiments is that these larvae sink in Q filaments above a threshold concentration and resume swimming when they exit a filament. So they're little on-off machines. So now can we use that um, behavior that we measured on very fine scale uh, in agent-based models of these organisms at a larger scale to see what would happen to them in the real world. And so uh, that's just what we did. We can calculate the trajectory of a larva. Oh, and let me back up and just say um, what we are going to do is uh, put our agent-based model into larger scale measured flow fields and measured concentration fields. So it's calculated larvae based on our small scale experiments in uh, embedded in measured flow fields. So we have our PLIF PIV data of concentrations and velocities that vary with time. So we can calculate the trajectory of a larva um, in the following way. At each time step, the larva is either swimming or sinking. Uh, it um, looks at the brightness of the pixel it's sitting in and decides which it's doing. And um, uh, uh, so that behavior choice depends on the local instantaneous Q concentration. If it's sinking, it always goes down, but if it's swimming, its swimming direction depends on the local instantaneous vorticity because as it's swimming, it's being tumbled in the eddies it's swimming through. So uh, we figure out the larva's uh, direction and um, speed, and then it's embedded in a chunk of water that's also moving. So, so we take the vector sum of both what the larva is doing and what the water is doing to determine where it is in the next step, and then we repeat. And so um, uh, we can uh, calculate the trajectories of thousands of larvae at randomly chosen starting positions in the water. Then from that, we can calculate the rate of transport of all these larvae into the reef down at the bottom of our data. And we can do it for larvae that sink in odor, and we can do it for larvae that do not respond to odors. And uh, what we find is in turbulent wavy flow, like we measure in the field and like we've measured in our wave flume, the model predicts that this simple on-off behavior of sinking in Q and swimming when not in Q enhances transport rates of these larvae into the reef by 20%. So these little dumb on-off machines are navigating simply by responding to local concentrations, not by figuring out a gradient and swimming in some direction, which they can't control when they swim because they're always being tumbled by the turbulent eddies.
So let me stop and um, remind you of the basic approach we've used in all these cases. The first thing is to quantify what the flow is like in the field. Then take those field measurements to the lab and in big wave flumes, we uh, replicate those um, field flow conditions. But in the flume, we're able to use things like PIV, planar laser induced fluorescence, or laser um, Doppler anemometry to measure fine scale flow. Then in order to look at the microscopic larvae, we have to mimic this fine scale flow in an even smaller device, um, such as our mini flume or our pico spritzer, uh, where the performance of the organisms can be measured and we can figure out things like how their behavior or the type of glue they use or their body shape or orientation can affect what happens to them. And then we can take the behaviors we measure and stick them back into um, uh, larger scale measured flow fields or measured concentration fields uh, using agent-based models. So uh, the experiments that I um, and field work that I mentioned were done with a lot of wonderful collaborators from a bunch of different universities. And those of you who know these folks will see that there are developmental biologists and engineers and biophysicists uh, uh, and mathematicians involved in, in these experiments. Uh, so it's um, like all of our work uh, at the interface between physics and biology and the ocean. This is a very uh, interdisciplinary um, endeavor. And I'll stop now and see if anybody has any questions or if people want to discuss other ways that they've been dealing with this problem of uh, scale, understanding small scale function and embedding it in large scale ecologically relevant flow fields. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Let's, I guess we can all applaud for her on Zoom these days. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And then I will open the floor for questions. And Jeanette had a question in the chat. So do you want to start, Jeanette? Uh, OK. Hi, Mimi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I already said hi. Jeanette. You know I work in this crazy new field of biodesign. And so often the question I ask men, all of the people I speak to is, do you ever consider, you know, when you do your mimics, right, your flow mimics, do you ever consider um, a bio-inspired design? And so I was trying to think of something for you. So you tell me if these are crazy. So let's say you're talking about recruiting your larvae to the benthos and your larvae like to lay in the boundary layer, correct? Yeah. Okay, so say you're a student talking to a recruiting agent. What is your advice to the student? Could you tell them to become part of the network of the business you're interested in? In <laughs> essence, you tell the student to get into the boundary layer of the business. Yeah, so what I would say is the kind of experiments we've done show that um, the micro scale topography is very important to where larvae uh, can, uh, stay put and where they want to be. And so what we've learned is um, uh, I could um, use the uh, topography of a fouling community to create the kinds of spaces I would need in that rugose surface, depending on the kind of larva I wanted to recruit, because different larvae will do better in different micro habitats. And also, uh, I will have learned um, from these experiments what the chemistry of the surface uh, uh, needs to be. So is it simply that I need to get a biofilm going, going or do I need to release perfume from a, a, a coral or something on the surface to get the species of larvae I want? So that's what I would say. Yeah, so yeah. we're learning principles here which then can be applied if you wanted, for example, to enhance recruitment of something into your, um, your uh, uh, fake coral reef, let's say. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. Geometry and chemistry. Good. Thank you. And I should also mention that the Navy was interested in funding this work because they don't want larvae to land. <laughs> so we, we also can learn what are hostile surfaces. Oh, yeah. No, I have an architectural firm who wants me to do a bio-inspired countertop. And so I'm looking into like the way larvae don't settle on shark skin as a mm -hmm. possible nano printing on the top of the countertop. What do you think mm -hmm. of that? Neat. Yeah, it's neat. Thank you. Uh, Marco, do you want to follow up? <laughs> yeah, I had a question. So thanks for the talk. Uh, it was very nice. I, um, I was thinking once you get down to your agent-based models, right, and uh, you have predictions like, for example, that uh, your sink versus uh, sink and swim, or rather, mm -hmm. was it hovering versus hovering plus sink uh, gives you a 20% enhancement in the attachment rate. Um, shouldn't you or did you uh, go and then check whether this is actually something that uh, that happens? I don't know, for example, in uh, mesoscopic experiments in the flume that are a bit more controlled. Yes, uh, so thank you for asking that. Those are slides I cut out of the talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, one of the ways to um, relate the small scale measurements to what happens in the field is to use the model to make a prediction that you can measure in the field. And unfortunately, the larvae um, are difficult to see in the field. But uh, one of the things we can calculate, uh, because they're, they're only 200 microns long and they're the same color as the coral. So when you're out there diving, you can't just count them. It's not like white barnacles on a black rock. So um, uh, what we were, uh, could do with the model is predict the spatial distribution of uh, settlement on the reef from the shoreward to the seaward uh, from the seaward to the shoreward part of the reef. And then we could study larval recruitment patterns by collecting coral from those different positions, bringing them back into the lab and letting the larvae grow up big enough to um, uh, count. And, uh, and our prediction did, did come true. The other thing we did is we tested assumptions of the model in the field too, about whether things like whether when larvae get down in amongst the coral, they stay there because it uh, always smells good and they always sink. Um, the other beauty of the models is we could say, what if they were less sensitive to the cue or more sensitive to the cue or they swam faster? So you can vary all those kinds of things as well. But um, it's only what the real larvae do that we could test in the field. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether I can follow up on, uh, on another question or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't want, I don't want to hijack the conversation. But, um, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so is it essentially, in quotes, just a matter of rescaling parameters? Or, uh, for example, in this case, the motility would um, essentially make also qualitative differences in, uh, for example, in where uh, we can find or, or which niches can be accessed by the by the organisms um, so i 'm not uh, i think i 'm answering your question so so we can use our models uh, again these were um, slides I left out of the talk, but we can um, use the model to um, invent different swimming strategies that would uh, replicate what different kinds of organisms do. And one question that we had, this um, sinking when you encounter an odor is a great strategy if the surface you want to land on is below you, but what if you're a fouling community organism and you want to land on a surface above you or next to you? What's the best strategy? So we could take flow measured um, and, near uh, those kinds of surfaces, either a vertical piling or a, a, a underside of, of a boat or something, and uh, replicate those in the wave flume and get our PLIF and PIV, and then put um, strategies like sink all the time, rise all the time passively, just be a passive particle or swim, but when you swim, your swimming direction is always reoriented by the turbulent eddies. And what we found is that 
swimming is the best strategy to enhance your probability of encountering a surface if you can't predict what direction it is relative to you. So those are the kinds of, of uh, things we can do um, uh, to explore different strategies and s swimming speeds. And, and you can also put body shapes in because if you're elongated, then you'll rotate in the flow until you're parallel with the shear and then you'll swim along that direction. Whereas if you're spherical, you'll just keep rotating. So we can use the models to play around with morphological and behavioral questions and with different kinds of habitats to um, try to colonize. Was, was that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Along the line, yes. <laughs> um, are there other questions for Mimi? Feel free to speak up. Um, George, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I have a, a quick question. One of the, I'm going to turn on my thingies. I think it's kind of neat to look at these things. Um, but always the question is, how do you put it into an even larger context? Is a 20% enhancement strong enough to, to change the whole evolutionary um, uh, development of these critters? So that's a really good question. And we, um, uh, we haven't interfaced any of this with evolution uh, for that kind of question. Um, uh, other things we've done where we've been interested in the consequences of body shape or uh, behavioral choices when you get on a surface, then you can think about um, uh, morphologies or behaviors or types of adhesion that simply won't work um, on coral reefs or won't work on wave swept shores or things like that. Um, so one could you look at the morphological features relative to the kinds of habitats where organisms are, but it would be fun to take it in that direction. Um, I'm assuming that a 20% enhancement of your probability of landing on the reef must be worth it because they do it. But <laughs> well, it's always that question. At what point do you stop looking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's interesting questions, and we haven't taken it in that direction yet, except in terms of body shape. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a high. I mean, given that the the movement is only important when they get near the surface, um, or there's this chemical signal, um, it's a pretty large evolutionary change that you're asking them to do in order to be able to find those surfaces for only 20%. I'm just curious. It's just maybe there's something else going on besides that we're not thinking about is what I'm saying. Well, the same chemical also induces metamorphosis um, once they get there. Uh, it, and it induces them to want to uh, glue themselves down. Yeah, okay. Anyway, but, just um, kind of curious, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we started that work because there was a big battle uh, between larval biologists who said larvae are passive tracers and there's there's such crummy swimmers, there's nothing they can do to affect where they go. And those were mostly field people. And then there were the lab people who put larvae in dishes with different chemicals and saw the chemicals cause them to change their behavior and said, oh, they must be navigating by chemical cues. So I was trying to see who was right. And it turns out they're both right. <laughs> The great peacemaker. <laughs> I think or I think or has some ideas about the twenty percent. Um, maybe he wants to make a make his point. Oh. Or <laughs> I'm pulling you out of the mute. Yeah, can mute. you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say uh, we we've done some calculations for these kind of things with the. Uh, with the coral problem. Um, and yes, 20% is huge. Actually, you just need to make a simple calculation. If you have one population that is doing 100%, one population doing 120%, within a few generations, the 120% will take over. So, and you actually start by much smaller gains and you get better as you go along. So 20% is huge. Great. <laughs> <laughs>
And I should ask uh, where that's published so I can go look that up and then I can answer George's question the next time around. Well, it's, it's, we, we've done that for a, uh, the, the Coral Ciliary Flow a paper I done with uh, Roman Stoker. I, I don't think we actually make the calculations in the paper. We just, mm -hmm. we're just asking the same questions because we're seeing uh, much smaller gains in, uh, in mass transport. Mm -hmm. You're asking how, how much are they actually gaining? But yes, the answer is, and in bacteria, you can see it. If you, if you look at papers on the, uh, the, the famous E. coli experiment uh, from Harvard, and the, uh, the gains in, uh, in growth, they are much smaller to begin with. And you can see that the, that the E. coli population, mutated populations take over. Mm. So, so yeah, again, 20% is beautiful. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. <laughs> On that note, for the last 10 minutes, we thought we would do breakout groups so people could meet each other and sort of continue these conversations, but it could be more interactive. And so I'm going to form breakout groups of four to five. Um, so we will do, I was like, we'll do about I was like eight breakout groups. Um, and it would give people a chance to meet each other and sort of talk. A number of people are dropping, so my yeah, exactly. Are, so yeah. It, this, if I can comment, is a, is a result of uh, people's comments in their sign in the sign up to uh, that pointed at the fact that they just didn't want to simply see a, a you know a seminar on Zoom and and that's it. They wanted something a bit more interactive. So it's a little bit of a trial. Uh, which I hope, uh, we hope it will go well. So we'll see. It doesn't yeah. go well if people start dropping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll give it a whirl today and then we'll see how it goes. Um, and then I will end the breakout groups in about 10 minutes. And so we can all just say thank you to Mimi one more time and goodbye. that I'm involved with, he's using these measurements and all that he's learned from it, and we're trying to put it in individual base particles in a model of the of the area. So, and, so that's where I come in. What are you embedding? What what is the scale of the flow that you're putting the larvae in? They are you. The, the scale of the flow it's it's regional at this point. So it's really to see if that behavior can have larger scale repercussion on the dispersal. So it's not the details of the settlement, it's really does it drive their dispersal in, in a larger context. Uh-huh, and so how do you get the, the um, is it still villagers you're looking at? Yes, yes, so it, the snail one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how do you put the, uh, the sinking or not sinking into that? Is it based on larger scale levels of turbulence? Yes, exactly. So it's obviously parametrized, but it's extrapolated from um, the, the flow conditions and the wind and the waves and, and seeing and the, the shear stress at the bottom. And so depending where the larvae are, they, they're more likely to sample certain turbulence or, or other parameters. Neat. And so, so by your small scale, you can relate what the larvae do to just a larger scale epsilon or TKE or something? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's um, 
it's based on on statistical distributions and what's more likely to happen or not but but it does drive differences right in the large scale dispersal of the larvae because obviously depending